waiting for Movies, TV, music, and more Follow, subscribe, stay up to date Episodes drop every other Monday Welcome to the Matt Watch That Podcast, the place for reviews, rants, and randomness. I'm your host, Matt Sarosky, filmmaker, film fan. Each episode, I'm going to watch a movie or TV pilot that I probably should have seen but never got around to. It could be a recent favorite, critic's choice, or cult classic. To join in on the conversation, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've discussed or suggestions as to what I should see next, use the hashtag MattWatchThat on social. Before we start, I wanted to wish everyone a happy 4th of July. Not sure if you could hear, but there are fireworks going off in the background. You see, New Yorkers like to start celebrating about a week and a half before the holiday. But we are in the summer blockbuster season. I saw The Flash, and despite the soft opening, it was a fun movie. I rarely read comic books, so I'm not sure how much of the Flashpoint story arc is included or how faithful the filmmakers were, but these are different mediums and should be judged based on the platform. It was great seeing Michael Keaton reprise the role of Bruce Wayne in Batman. He was my big screen Batman growing up, so I have a soft spot for his portrayal. Now, Adam West was my first Batman as repeats of the 1966 series was frequent on WPIX in New York. There were also a lot of uncredited cameos, which isn't a spoiler. At this point, people know in these superhero movies that there are crossovers and surprises, so it should be expected. I'm continually impressed with the work of Andy Muschietti. His feature-length directorial debut was Mama, starring Jessica Chastain and produced by Guillermo del Toro. It was an effective fantasy suspense film that grossed $160 million at the box office on a $15 million budget. He was hired to direct the adaptation of the Stephen King novel It, which was a two-parter, It and It Chapter 2. His next project will be the Batman movie, The Brave and the Bold. Now, let's talk about the controversy. Or let's not. I understand that some people won't support the movie because of Ezra Miller and his extracurricular activities, polite euphemism. I mentioned in a previous podcast that I don't care about the personal lives of celebrities, so if they make poor or reckless decisions, it doesn't have an impact on my life. There are people out there that seem to take joy in perpetually canceling someone. That's not me. I also know I've talked about some celebrities I've met before, but that's because it amuses me. The universe keeps sending me these people, and I couldn't care less. But my feeling has always been, if someone does something illegal, they should be charged and tried before a jury of their peers. If they're found guilty, they should be sentenced and serve their time. After they're out, they should be able to rebuild their lives and start anew. At one point, I thought everyone agreed with this assessment, but there are certain politicians in Washington that seem to believe otherwise. So, watch The Flash, don't watch The Flash. Making a movie is hard, and I want to support the hundreds of people who put the time and effort into making the film possible. On to the main attraction. Each review will end with a ranking out of five stars. One star is Skip It. Two stars Watch at Your Own Risk. Three stars Standard Fare. Four stars Worth Checking Out. And five stars Must See. Now, if I give a title five stars, it doesn't mean I'm comparing it to Casablanca, Jaws, or Seinfeld. I rank titles based on other movies or TV series in that genre and at that time period. On this episode of the podcast, I'll be reviewing Big Trouble in Little China from 1986. It was directed by John Carpenter, who helmed Dark Star, Assault on Precinct 13, Halloween, The Fog, and They Live. The screenplay was co-written by Gary Goldman, who would go on to describe Total Recall and Navy Seals. W.D. Richter, who wrote the remakes of Invasion of the Body Snatchers in 1978 and Dracula in 1979, and was nominated for Best Writing, Screenplay Written for the Screen for Brubaker, and David Z. Weinstein, which is his only writing credit. It stars Kurt Russell as Jack Burton. When I reviewed Backdraft in Season 2 of the podcast, I did a brief filmography of Kurt, so instead of repeating myself, I'll say check out that episode. 
He would collaborate with John Carpenter on Escape from New York, Escape from L.A., The Thing, and the TV movie Elvis. Kim Cattrall portrays Gracie Law. She was born in Liverpool but raised in British Columbia, Canada. She moved to New York at 16 and attended the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. She made her feature debut in Otto Preminger's Rosebud. She then appeared in episodes of Quincy M.E., Logan's Run, Columbo, Starsky and Hutch, The Paper Chase, The Incredible Hulk, and Charlie's Angels. Her breakthrough role would be in Porky's as Miss Honeywell. That was followed by Police Academy. In 1987, she starred in Mannequin and Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. But she would be best remembered as Samantha Jones in Sex and the City, which she would be nominated for five Primetime Emmy Awards and won a Best Supporting Actress Golden Globe. It was recently announced that she'll make a cameo in the spinoff, and just like that. This is something to look out for. In the scene at the brothel, Kurt Russell is wearing the same suit that he appeared in in Used Cars. So let's jump into it. A lawyer, played by Jerry Hardin, Deep Throat from the X-Files, is interviewing a tour bus driver in Chinatown, San Francisco, Egg Shen, performed by Victor Wong, known for the Golden Child, Tremors, and the Three Ninjas franchise. He wants to know the whereabouts of Jack Burton and his truck, the Pork Chop Express. Egg Shen says that Jack has shown great courage, and he's in debt to the man. The lawyer counters that half of the city block has exploded in green flames, and all hell is breaking loose across the city. If either of them is involved, they could be in a great deal of trouble. Big trouble, you might say. The lawyer has one question about Egg Shen's belief in magic and sorcery, but instead of a traditional answer, Egg Shen raises his hands and between them, bolts of electricity form. After the opening credits, Jack Burton visits his friend Wang, who's a restaurant owner. They make a friendly wager over the bean-counting game Fantan. After Jack wins handedly, Wang bets, double or nothing, that he can cut a bottle in half. When he fails the feat, he confesses that he doesn't have the money on hand. To ensure he pays up, Jack accompanies him to the airport to pick up his fiancée, Mao Yin. While waiting for Flight 26, Jack gets intrigued by a blonde lawyer appropriately named Gracie Law, who's meeting with Tara. Their conversation gets interrupted by the Lords of Death street gang, who tries to capture Tara, but after a confrontation with Jack, they turn their attention to Mao Yin and kidnap her. Jack and Wang pursue the gang, and wind up in an alley, embroiled in a street fight between the Chang Sing and Wing Kong, two ancient Chinese societies. Here's a quote without context. Sooner or later, I rub everyone the wrong way. Big Trouble in Little China is a fun ride of a movie. Normally, opening teasers have a little more action to instantly engage the viewer, but in this case, there's an air of mystery and intrigue, especially in how it ends. I think it shows that it isn't a standard action movie. There will be elements of fantasy. Jack Burton is amusing. He's braggadocious, reacts before he thinks, which leads him to be in some precarious positions. He's a bit like the viewer, an outsider trying to figure the backstory of these ancient underground societies. Kim Cattrall plays Gracie with a lot of chutzpah, which has a silent C. I swear, I spelled that word so badly, Microsoft had no alternative suggestions. But her interplay with Jack is entertaining, trading barbs back and forth. Dennis Dunn might play the sidekick, Wang, but his character is the most competent, and Jack would be lost or worse without him. Now for a little trivial trivia. The characters of the Three Storms, Rain, Thunder, and Lightning, were the partial inspiration for Raiden from the popular video game Mortal Kombat. Big Trouble in Little China was produced by Larry J. Franco. It was filmed on location in Chinatown, but mostly on the 20th Century Fox Studios lot. Carpenter was given only 10 weeks of pre-production, partially to beat into theaters the similarly themed The Golden Child released by Paramount Pictures. The cinematography was captured by Dean Cundy, whose filmography includes Halloween, Romancing the Stone, Back to the Future, Hook, Jurassic Park, Apollo 13, and was nominated for Best Cinematography for Who Framed Roger Rabbit. It was co-edited by Steve Markovich, Mark Warner, and Edward A. Warsilka. Each had success working as solo acts on Prince of Darkness, Fire in the Sky, Rocky III, 48 Hours, The Running Man, and Escape from L.A. The score was composed by John Carpenter and Alan Howarth. This isn't their first collaboration, which started with Escape from New York, and continued with Halloween 2 and 3, Christine, Prince of Darkness, and They Live. 
Alan's music has been featured in Halloween 4 and 5, The Dentist, and The Osterman Weekend. He's also an accomplished sound designer who worked on the first six Star Trek movies, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Back to the Future 2 and 3, and Poltergeist. The music had that signature synthesized carpenter sound. The soundtrack featured the theme song, Big Trouble in Little China, performed by the Coupe de Villes, whose members include John Carpenter, Nick Castle, who played the shape in the original Halloween, and Tommy Lee Wallace, editor of the original Halloween and director of controversial Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Which I kind of like. Shh. The runtime is 1 hour 39 minutes. It had a budget of $20 million and grossed $11 million at the box office. It was considered a bomb, overshadowed by the marketing push for Aliens, which would be released in theaters two weeks later, but has since become a cult classic. I know physical media is so passe these days, but the Blu-ray features three different audio commentaries, which gives some great insight into the process of filmmaking, as well as gag reels, interviews, and an isolated score. On the Ski Index, I give it 4 out of 5 stars, and half a star if you're a fan of 80s action movies. If you've seen Big Trouble in Little China and have opinions on the movie, let me know what you think using the hashtag MattWatchThat. Dumb. Moving right along, each episode, I'm going to post clips that I think people should watch. It could be movie trailers, music videos, interviews, or something completely random. Search for my YouTube page and there'll be a playlist called Matt Watch That Playback. After watching Big Trouble in Little China, I was in a bit of a 80s mood, and I revisited one of my favorite soundtracks, Rocky IV. Yes, it's the reason why I rank that movie very high in the Rocky franchise. That was a banger. Burning Heart by Survivor, Hearts on Fire, John Cafferty, Living in America, performed by James Brown. But my favorite happens to be No Easy Way Out. It was featured over the driving montage after Adrian tells Rocky, You can't win! Which is one of the best scenes between Talia Shire and Sylvester Stallone. But who is Robert Tepper? He was born in Bayonne, New Jersey, and moved to New York to become a songwriter. In 1978, he wrote the song This Is Love for Paul Anka. It would reach number three on the adult contemporary charts. In 1981, he teamed up with singer Benny Mardonis to comprise the song Into the Night, which peaked at number 11 on the Billboard Hot 100 and sold one million copies. In 1985, his song La Belle Age was featured on Pat Benatar's album Seven the Hard Way and got to number 19 on the mainstream rock charts. The next year, he relocated to Los Angeles and released his first solo album named No Easy Way Out. Sylvester Stallone heard the title track and included it in his movie Rocky IV. He liked the album so much, Sly used another song, Angel of the City, on the soundtrack for his next movie, Cobra. His follow-up in 1988, Modern Madness, didn't reach the success of his debut. He joined as a member of Iron Butterfly from 1990 to 1992. He since released four additional studio albums, including 2022's Feels Like Monday, but his main focus has been writing music for television and film. I've selected a couple of his tunes, and they're all available in the Matt Watch That Playback playlist on YouTube. Check it out. Now it's time for the recommendation. Yes, you heard that right. It's the word recommendation with Matt in the middle. I'm going to end each podcast with my own recommendation of a movie or TV series. Today I'm talking about Red Notice, directed by Ross and Marshall Thurber, who also helmed The Mysteries of Pittsburgh and Were the Millers. But my favorite movie of his, of course, is Dodgeball, one of the best comedies of the aughts, and it's up there for my all-time funny flicks. This movie would be the third collaboration with Dwayne The Rock Johnson, after Central Intelligence and Skyscraper. It tells a story of notorious thief Nolan Booth, who plans on stealing three bejeweled eggs that once belonged to Cleopatra, given to her by Mark Antony. The first is located at the Museo Nazionale de Castel Sant'Angelo. The second was bought at an auction and part of a private collection. An Egyptian billionaire wants to reunite the three, and offers a reward for the whereabouts of the last egg, which Booth claims to know. Hot on the trail is FBI agent John Hartley, who works with Interpol agent Yervashi Das to apprehend him. But in a strange twist of fate, both Booth and Hartley end up in a Russian prison. 
they decide to team up to escape from the gulag and find the third egg. It stars Ryan Reynolds, Dwayne Johnson, and Gal Gadot in what has to be the least attractive cast in movie history. I had seen The Atom Project and rewatched Central Intelligence recently, so I thought I'd check this one out. And I'll be honest, I'd watch Gal Gadot read the latest discriminatory bill from Ron DeSantis and still be enamored with her. Similar to Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, there are twists and turns, double crosses, betrayals. It keeps the viewer on their toes, but don't look too closely at the plot. That's not the point. It's the interplay between the characters that keeps the train moving. This looked like a fun set to be on. At the time, it was the most expensive movie produced by Netflix at a whopping $200 million, and it's all apparent on screen. There are some really spectacular stunts and exotic locations, fight scenes, chases, everything you could expect. Red Notice became the most viewed film on Netflix on the day it premiered. There are two sequels in development, which will be shot back to back, but no release date has been announced. That's all for this edition of Matt Watch That. Thanks for listening to me babble. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've discussed, or suggestions as to what movie or TV pilot I should see, use the hashtag MattWatchThat on social. Head over to MattSarosky.com for the latest news and updates, and come back next time for the reviews, rants, and randomness. It was directed by John Carpenter, who helmed Dark Salt. No comments. The first is located at the Musée National. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I hyped it in my head that I was going to get it on the first try, but um, yeah, not meant to be.